42, we came to Kimbleton, uh, Iowa, and to uh, Emmanuel, which at that time this was a, and it was a very large Danish community, and I, I think still is. Uh, Kimbleton, as many little towns, and I think Elkhorn, and certainly the little town we live in in the Upper Peninsula, uh, really has to struggle uh, with being a small town. But at that time, it seemed to be a rather thriving community. I remember we had a couple of grocery stores and so forth in, in Kimbleton. We do have some film that I would like to be able to show from the 50th anniversary at that time because there's a wonderful picture, a shot of Dr. So there. Do you remember any of you remember <laughs> Dr. So and some of the other people from that uh, community? But anyway, this, is, this was the family. Then my sister was born and a karma Ibsen. She's a little redhead there, and our family never has been the same since. <laughs> <laughs> NSF Grunfei, and, and, uh, because he is uh, an important, uh, whether or not you agree with him, he's an and uh, there's things in, in, he lived so long and wrote so much that there are things to both agree with and disagree with, no matter who you are. <laughs> but uh, very, very interesting person. Um, he, uh, he really lived at a time of the Enlightenment was very big. Uh, one of the things he had people understand is that life had to be spiritually discerned. It could never be comprehended by mere intellect. Now this was the time when everybody was really thinking that the intellect was going to solve everything. Um, in the 90s, I heard a lecture by Walter Capps which really changed my thinking about uh, Grunfi and about my heritage, these are the, the way he said the principles was affirmation of life, stay as close to nature as possible, the goodness and beauty of ordinary life, and lifelong learning and education. He said these are the things that meet the challenges of today, which he described then as diversity, ethnicity, violence, problems with the environment, poverty, and illiteracy as being the main problems. Uh, I think now more than 10 years later, most of these problems have become much worse. Uh, we now have the violence has deteriorated into um, terrorism, environment problems. Now we have what we call global warming. Poverty uh, has also gotten worse in, in many countries. So, and the problems of education have increased. So uh, now we have these challenges have become even larger. Here's a picture of my father in his study. That's NFS Grunfi, a picture on the wall. Uh, and that's the little Danish royal typewriter that he did his sermons on. During, uh, during that time, there was something called Trinity. It was a season of the church called Trinity, which, uh, and so this is from that section. We don't have that anymore, but it's after Pentecost, basically. It deals with an interesting question. What is sin? <clears throat> what is sin? For many people, sin means to deviate from whatever moral code exists in their community. But communities differ widely in their understanding. What some consider to be a sin in one place or time is not considered sinful in another culture or under different circumstances. What is sin? The Greek word for sin means to miss the mark. A better definition of sin is difficult to find. To miss the mark is not to do the will of God, to not obey His will. But what is the will of God, and how can we know it? God has a unique and different purpose for each one of us. There is also a certain will that lies within each of us, a will inclined to that purpose, the will of God. So when we live out, out the unique purpose He has for us, we are fulfilling God's will. To become increasingly attuned to that purpose is to learn God's will and become more able to live accordingly. If to sin is not to do the will of God, what does it mean to miss the mark? What are the marks of sin? What is the evidence that something is sinful? Missing the mark is a matter of degree. Sometimes we miss the mark by a long shot. At times we sense we are growing closer to fulfilling the purpose God has for us. We may not be aware we are doing God's will until much later in retrospect. Missing the mark can also be a means of spiritual growth. We can learn from our mistakes. Susanna Wesley once gave this answer, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes off the relish of spiritual things, 
That is sin for you. That is a good definition of sin and its consequences. Think of what is happening in Europe, where innocent civilians are dying in the air raids. Whatever weakens your, your reason, whatever impairs the tenderness of your conscience. Dean Wicks of Princeton University writes of the official account of the sinking of the Titanic. Their conscience is no longer tender. Some of the officers did not feel responsible for human lives. The captain's desire for fame, the radio operator's desire for sleep, seem innocent, but not when the cost was hundreds of lives. Their reason was weakened. When we lose the tenderness of our conscience, we do many things that seem innocent but cause great trouble. We miss the mark. How do we keep our consciences sensitive in today's world? It is no easy matter. There is no other way than to seek and find the purpose and the will of God. It is a great moment in anyone's life when God becomes a living reality. When out of the silence of night or in the busy day, one hears the voice of the Eternal. It came to Abraham, Jacob, Elijah, and Paul. It comes to everyone who really cares for himself and his fellow men, who considers the mysteries that surround and darken human existence. Knock on the door, seek, you shall find. Amen. Let us pray. I won't read the whole um, story afterwards, but I'll read a little bit of it. This is about um, a woman named Edna who lives on a farm. Her son is fighting in the Pacific. Her oldest daughter has just gotten married, and she has some younger children. And her husband has started driving truck because uh, they can't quite make it on the farm without uh, some, some help. And so she goes out each morning and sits on the porch, has a cup of real good dark coffee before anything happens to the, the day. Each morning before she listened to the radio for news about the war, Edna had her coffee and time with God. That way, her whole day went better. She needed God's help to keep from worrying about James. Worrying did no good. Last they heard, James was in the Philippines, but that was all they knew. Amos said, don't worry, James can take care of himself, but Edna was not so sure. With Bonnie, James, and Amos gone, Edna was now alone more than she had been for years, and she was beginning to get a sense of who she was by herself. She thought of the gray-haired widows who sat alone in the church pews. She would likely join them one day. After all her years of craving privacy, she feared the day would come when she might not know what to do with herself. The words from yesterday's sermon still clung to her mind, the tenderness of your conscience. Edna's overzealous conscience burdened her. Years ago, a Sunday school teacher had taught her that whatever she did to another person, she did to Jesus. And Edna had interpreted it, and Edna interpreted it literally. When Edna bumped into someone in the grocery store, she felt like she was bumping into Jesus. I'm sorry, she'd say, I'm sorry. Guilt consumed her when she missed church or choir practice. Mistakes haunted her. Edna would replay incidents in her mind over and over, changing her words to make them kinder, wanting to make things right, often learning to her surprise that she not made a mistake or offended anyone at all. You're too soft, Amel would say, but she was not so sure. Edna was well acquainted with something deep and hard inside her. She struggled to keep her conscience in good repair. Beneath her softness, she knew there was an alien lack of caring. 5.15, a rooster crowed, and then another. Edna basked in the luxury of her morning prayer. First she recited a hymn they sang in church. Praise to the Lord the Almighty, the King of creation. Praise Him, or praise Him for he is my help and salvation. And the sat there for a few moments and then mentally prayed as her mother had taught her a long time ago. A hymn of praise was always followed by prayers of thanks, pausing to send blessings of thankfulness towards each object of her gratitude. Thank you, God, for this beautiful day, for the rain yesterday, for Emil, for the children, our home, the church, for the sunshine, and for Daryl's new calf, and then her prayer for others. Please, God, keep James safe from harm. Be with Emil on the road. Protect him. Help him to stay awake. Bless Bonnie and Everett. Keep them happy. She envied Bonnie and Everett starting out in life. Already they had a nicer home than their parents. She hoped soon they would have children. Edna wanted another baby in the family. She wanted to be a grandmother. She thought again about James. Keep James safe and keep his conscience tender. But what if a tender conscience caused his death, caused him to be killed? 
Keep him safe, she prayed again, but then she wondered, if war hardens his conscience, what will happen to him? What kind of person will he become? Be with him, be with him always, no matter what happens. And then she prayed for forgiveness, 